the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Ann Jones. She's a journalist, photographer, and the author of eight books of nonfiction, including Women Who Kill, Next Time She'll Be Dead, Kabul in Winter, and War Is Not Over When It's Over. She's reported on the impact of war in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, and was embedded with U.S. forces in Afghanistan. She regularly writes for The Nation and TomDispatch.com. Her new book is They Were Soldiers, How the Wounded Returned from America's Wars, The Untold Story. So thank you so much for being for being on this program. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thanks. Um, my first question is is actually a quote from the first sentence of your book, um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about it, which is, sooner or later, almost every American soldier comes home on a stretcher, in a box, or in an altered state of mind. Um, I believe that's true. Uh, and uh, what I tried to undertake for this book is to follow those who had the kind of wounds that bring them home in a box or on a stretcher, and in some cases in an altered state of mind. But I also, um, after following those um, wounded and very badly damaged soldiers home, I also looked into what um, many soldiers do when they get back here, and many of them um, become very violent and uh, get into all sorts of trouble, um, which we could talk about at some length. But clearly, they have come home in an altered state of mind. And one thing that um, struck me as enormously sad is the number of parents of veterans I talked to who said, this is not our child that they sent back to us. They they could not recognize their own child in the the boy or the girl who had come home to them. They were that changed. You know, it reminds me of a line that my mom heard a soldier's mother say one time that um, but really stuck with her, which is, um, I sent you my son and, and I got back a monster. Yes. Um, Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so do there you are there are. I was going to say there are others, other parents who would say, "I sent you my son, and you sent me back a vegetable." Um, uh, you could put a whole range of um, of uh, uh, comments in there at the end of that sentence because they do come home in a great variety of damaged states. And that's, exa that's exactly the way the parents feel. And so um, do you want to give um, a couple examples from the book of, of what you mean? Because you know, whether we're talking about vegetable or, or anything else, this is still pretty abstract. So can you, can you talk a little bit about, about what you're talking about here? Well, um, one, one particular soldier um, who whose progress I followed um, was a, a veteran of Iraq. He was there at the invasion and came home and seemed to be fine, got a really good job, bought a house with the money he'd saved, bought a car, was doing just great until his mom got a call that um, his mother lived in the same town, and she got a call from his boss saying, he was not coming to work anymore, and where was he? And uh, she tracked him down. He had fallen into a deep depression. Uh, he wound up, to, to cut a long story a little bit shorter, 
he came home to his mother's house in a terrible state of depression. He went uh, went into his old bedroom, went to sleep in his childhood bed, and he remained in that bed for more than three years. Um, and during that time, for reasons that the doctors could not explain, his body produced so much acid that it began to, in a sense, eat itself. That's the way his mother puts it. Um, all of his teeth had to be removed. His gallbladder had to be removed. Um, after several years of this, with no help from the VA, um, but a great deal of help from his family and private doctors that they hired, he became a little bit better, um, got so he could um, keep a checkbook, he could get up and dress himself, he could even drive a car. But he still lives in his mother's house, um, is absolutely uh, dependent upon the care, full-time care of his family, which means then that as a consequence of this boy coming home in this condition, his mother describes the what she calls the ripple effect of that, although I think that's too small a word, because she, who was a, a um, she's a psychotherapist and was um, in charge of the program in the high schools in their city for at-risk youth. She was very highly respected counselor for youth. She had to quit that job in order to take care of her son. And the other members of her family, her husband, um, a, a stepson, uh, the boy's sister, all had their lives impacted in ways that caused them to give up a job or to give up some activities that were or plans that were important to them to help to take care of this boy. And with the, the mothers uh, leaving her job in the school, that impacted all the kids that she was taking care of. She was helping in the school. And that, in turn, impacts their families. So that... Um, when one boy comes home as a monster or a vegetable or in a terribly damaged state, uh, it's not just that individual family that pays, but the after effects of that can move out into the, the whole community. And that's something that we see in many different forms of trauma where um, you can have someone who suffers childhood abuse and... Um, sometimes they then when they grow up can certainly um, because of their own PTSD can um, affect others around them who then as, as that woman said that can ripple out so it's not just war but this can happen with many other forms of, of PTSD as well well um, is that that's true but the extent of the damage in war is beyond anything I have I have ever seen, and I've been working with women um, uh, affected by the trauma of battering and rape and um, so-called domestic violence most of my adult life. I've written many books about it, and I understand what you're saying about the ripple effects of that damage within the family. But this is uh, is almost beyond belief because the um, the people are so damaged that they require so much care like this boy who apparently had no physical injuries at all in the war but it's been 10 years now and he's still back in the bedroom of his childhood and cannot cannot pull anything like a life together and his mother says, this is, this is not my son who came back to me. But he tries so hard that I have to do everything I can to help this, this boy they've, they've sent back to me. But the, also the, the soldiers who are so incredibly physically damaged, uh, those who have been hit by explosives or terrible um, 
uh, injuries from snipers and so on. Um, and the, the amputees uh, will, in many cases, be completely dependent on their families for the rest of their lives. And so all of this uh, adds up to something that, that even the doctors and the nurses, the medical personnel at Bagram Base in Afghanistan, at Landstuhl uh, Regional Medical Center in Germany, which is the next higher level of trauma care, and at Walter Reed and Bethesda, which is the top level of trauma care for those returning physically injured vets. All of those medical personnel told me they have never seen injuries to a human body as catastrophic as those that are coming out of Afghanistan. And that, in turn, is taking a terrible toll on, on those doctors who day in, day out are faced with these um, torn-apart kids that they're, uh, whose lives they are expected to save. So why are, the, why are the injuries so much more severe? Let's talk about physical injuries for a second and then jump to the psychological. Why are the injuries so much more severe, do you think? Um, well, most of the injuries in Afghanistan are caused by explosive devices. And that was also true in the Iraq War. But in Iraq, um, they, most of the patrols used uh, some kind of armored vehicles, often inadequate, so that many were killed in, in those explosions. But in uh, Afghanistan, remember, General Petraeus came up with the bright idea of reinstating counterinsurgency doctrine, a doctrine that uh, became famous in uh, Vietnam, of course, for being a complete and utter failure. But uh, nevertheless, General Petraeus instituted that in uh, Afghanistan, and it called for the patrols to get out of their vehicles, to dismount and patrol on foot. And you have to keep in mind that Afghanistan is a country that has that is completely laced with landmines left over from the Soviet war. And some demining has been done, but it hasn't progressed very far. So that uh, commonly farmers and children in Afghanistan are getting blown up all the time. They say the the current rate is between 30 and 60 Afghans a month encounter landmines or IEDs. So our soldiers are out there walking around among the landmines and among the um, explosive devices that the Taliban is planting for them. And so when when they hit an IED, they're not hitting it while they're sheltered inside an armored vehicle. They're stepping right on it. And uh, the blast usually comes right up their legs and into their body. It very commonly takes off both legs. It can destroy the whole pe pelvic area, the interior of the pelvic area, which means the urinary tract and other important systems. So, um, and then often when a soldier steps on one of these bombs, it also will take off an arm or part of an arm that's swinging forward uh, as he steps onto the, to the bomb. So there's not much left of a soldier that has that kind of casualty, and there have been thousands like this in Afghanistan. And these are these are often 18, 19 year old kids. That's right. That's right. Um, which so go ahead. I, was, it's, I mean, obviously, losing your legs is is horrible, and. One of the most moving parts of your book, I thought, was their actual description of what they felt the moment they stepped on it. I, I yes. couldn't get the images out of my mind of them feeling that their legs are being driven all the way up into their chest. I, I, that's, that's, that's kind of an image I wish I didn't have, and I'm sure it's an image that they wish they didn't have. And then in addition yes. to, to that, losing their legs, which is obviously horrible, these are also 18- and 19-year-olds who will, in many cases, um, never have sex. I mean, they're, they've 
you, you, you talked at length about, when they, when, they hit, when they step on an IED, oftentimes the first thing they reach for is to make sure that their genitals are still there. Um, That's the first thing they check. They, they always tell that. And, of, uh, of course, very often they're missing. And that, that is in itself a, a terrible experience for the surgeons to have. I, I write about one of the surgeons um, who's, who was a urological surgeon whose specialty uh, and the reason he was sent to uh, uh, the hospital at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan was to repair the, uh, the urinary systems of soldiers who'd had these injuries. But the very first operation he had to do there was of a, a very young kid who had lost both his legs and his genitalia, his urinary system was in shreds, and as this doctor described it, his penis was hanging by a little thread of flesh. And the doctor said that it was one of the hardest things and most emotional things he had ever had to do to amputate that penis and put it into the container of medical waste. But since then, of course, he and others have done many, many, many more surgeries just like that. So why, <coughs> excuse me, why, can you talk a little bit about the processes of, by which the, even those who return physically whole can sometimes be forever changed. Can you talk about how that process, what happens to them? Um, it, 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 it's not one story, you know. They, there are many versions of that story, but I talk to many families uh, and many vets who came home and for a while they, like the boy I described before, they seem to be doing just fine. But something happens. They cannot sustain it over the long haul because they find they don't really fit anymore for various, for various reasons. Some have become, have all those symptoms of PTSD, the hypervigilance, the uh, tendency to uh, sudden irrational anger blowing up at people um, and uh, the risky behavior that leads them into abusing alcohol and abusing drugs and um, uh, driving dangerously, riding motorcycles dangerously. Many of them are killed that way not long after they return. So in, in some ways, they find that they don't fit into civilian life anymore. They, they can't seem to get back into their own families, in a way. And the families don't know how to treat them, um, especially when, as we mentioned, the, the, the youngsters are so changed that the families hardly recognize them. So... Um, uh, and I think there, there are many other reasons. Many soldiers told me that they, they couldn't get back into life in this country because having been in Afghanistan or in Iraq, they had seen how other people lived. And uh, as one uh, Marine put it to me, you know, what, we know how other people live. We know the price they pay for our living what the American way of life. And they, they find it impossible to enter into that American way of life again because they've seen how much better off people are here than people in the rest of the world. And they say nobody wants to hear that from them. The Marines said to me, the last people they want to hear from are the veterans of these wars because we know too much 
and they think we're the crazy, you know, we may turn into those crazy Vietnam vets back again. So the the soldiers who feel that way often complain that if they go to the VA for any kind of medical complaint, uh, you know, from sore feet to to back pain, they're going to wind up heavily medicated because uh, one effect of the of medication supposedly is to ease the the soldier's suffering but what those soldiers say is that the real purpose of the medication is to shut them up because nobody wants to hear what they've learned uh, about these wars by fighting in them so there's there are different scenarios for different soldiers but the consequences um, often look very much the same. And I want to talk, you mentioned the VA, and I want to talk for a second about um, the VA programs for um, the wives of military members. And that, frankly, I thought was one of the most appalling parts of the book. I mean, there's, there are many parts that were just, that just broke my heart, but one of them was the um, what the VA says to the women, to the wives of veterans with PTSD, to basically all of the veteran, veteran symptoms is quote, give him his space. Yes, and then was... the three A's. If you can talk about that and the three A's, which I just found horrifying. Um, that that program was actually not at the VA, but at Walter Reed Hospital. And it was a special program for the family members of returned veterans. And it was to have included family members of any vet who, as they put it, was having uh, challenges in reintegrating into the family. But as it turned out, there was only one father in the room and all the other people who came concerned about a, a returning vet and trying to help that vet reintegrate were the wives or the mothers of the of the veterans and most of them were were the wives and the advice um, this was a program that had been commissioned of some women psychologists so-called experts by uh, the Department of Defense and so, of course, the Department of Defense gets the kind of so-called experts it wants, gets them to say what it wants. So the lesson of this, uh, these workshop sessions to the women, whatever they said about the behavior of their returned husbands, for example, you know, he won't talk to, to me, he isolates himself, or he he doesn't want to have anything to do with the children, or he's abusive to the children, or, you know, he's he's doing things himself like risky driving that, that are, make me very nervous. No matter what it was that the women brought up about their hus returned husband's behavior, the answer was always... Just give him his space. Give him his space. Uh, and the only exception to that rule, um, many of the of the veterans who return are not interested in resuming sexual relationships with their wives, their or girlfriends. They don't seem to be capable of it or interested in it. But then they, you know, they're so changeable, they're so volatile that at other times they may actually demand sex. So the experts advised the women in the group that when, uh, when the veteran wanted sex, well, then you were supposed to give him your body, not his space. Um, and the women, of course, complained that the the men had been watching porn all the time that they were in the in in the uh, army, and they came back demanding a kind of sex that uh, at least one of these women spoke up and said she was absolutely not prepared to comply with, and it was her intention to get a divorce. 
um, she was a very young woman who said she had the backing of her parents and she had a college education. She didn't have any children yet. She wanted her space and she wanted to to get it for herself. The other women in the room, all of whom had children and had never held a job, didn't have job skills, were dependent upon their husband's military salaries, were very envious of that. They expressed, several of them expressed the idea that they would like to do that too. They would really like to start over, but there was no way they could because they had to take care of their kids. Um, so how do the... Wait a second. Before I ask that, there's another question, which is that you were talking about silencing the veterans, and that made me think, can you talk for a second about the um, the difference in response? That was in 2007, I believe it was, was the the expose on Walter Reed Hospital and how bad the That's conditions right. were there. And then mm-hmm. part of the response by the government has been to make it so that reporters no longer have such easy access to um, to, to actually talk to soldiers. Can you talk about that a minute? Because that also has to do with the silencing. Yes. Um, uh, Ann Hull and Dana Priest at the Washington Post did that wonderful series of articles that won the Pulitzer Prize um, exposing the the neglect and mistreatment of uh, veterans at Walter Reed. And as you said, that was in 2007. And um, when I uh, decided to do this project, I, I spoke with Dana Priest and said, how how did uh, you get access to Walter Reed? And she said, well, we just walked in. Well, that was absolutely impossible. Uh, and it took me a year to uh, get permission to follow these veterans uh, home from the wars. And the toughest part of it was getting access to Walter Reed. They, uh, boy, they didn't want anybody coming in. And at that time, I was not presenting myself as a reporter because I was a research uh, a scholar then on a fellowship at Harvard. And so I presented myself as what I, in fact, was at the time, uh, a researcher at Harvard working on a book about returning soldiers. They still didn't want any part of me. So it took a very long time uh, to get access to the hospital, and then I was not allowed to uh, speak to any of the patients in the hospital. Uh, and I was not even allowed to speak to staff members without the uh, accompanying public affairs officer to sit in the room, which clearly reminded the staff members to be very careful of what they said to me. Now, I managed, uh, as as any good reporter would, to uh, elude my minders from time to time, and to work my way into places they didn't expect me to be and to get in some words with uh, with some of the soldiers. And, of course, I also managed to talk to many of them outside of the hospital or to their families outside of the hospital. So I did get more information than the military wanted me to have. But they're guarding very closely um, what what the soldiers can say about their care to anybody uh, from the press or even to researchers. You know, I used to teach at Pelican Bay State Prison, which is a super maximum security prison here in Northern California. And mm-hmm. what you say strikes me for a number of reasons, one of which is that, yeah, reporters have to go through channels to interview a prisoner in the supermax, but it sounds to me like the access to a prisoner, that that a prisoner's capacity to reach a journalist is actually much greater than a soldier in Walter Reed, because they don't have to go through that level of of hoop jumping to to, to speak to a reporter. I, I yes, find that extraordinary I, I, that, that a, a, a wounded veteran 
um, is is um, is has more difficulty speaking out about their condition than does a prisoner in a super maximum security facility. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know if the if the if the um, patients, the veterans who are hospitalized in those hospitals, know that there are researchers or or journalists who would want to talk to them. You know, they're they are treated by the the medical caregivers who all wear combat uniforms and combat boots in the hospital which i thought was a, a little strange but they're they're treated by all these people in army gear and nobody else uh gets close to them and of course the official reason for that given is that they're protecting patient privacy but who knows whether those those patients want that kind of privacy? Certainly, when uh, when Ann Hull and Dana Priest went in to Walter Reed, they found many uh, patients who told them a lot. I mean, who were perfectly willing to talk with them and and actually go on the record uh with their own names take responsibility even though they had good reason to fear it might make their own treatment worse so uh judging by the experience of those two reporters there are plenty of soldiers who want to talk about what's going on with them but uh hard to get to them right well and, and we both know the importance of of telling one story to trauma recovery in any case. Um, yes. So I want to I want to go back. So that was that was a question I should have asked you before the question about the 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 three A's. And I want to go back to to that thread and ask. Um, so how do dominant ideas about masculinity complicate the psychological experiences of wounded veterans? Where does masculinity well, play into this whole this whole picture? Yeah. In fact. Um, uh, you know, Judith Herman, the um, psychiatrist who and and uh, professor of psychiatry who who wrote the oh, she's wonderful. The, she wrote the book Trauma and Recovery, which is really the definitive book on on uh, all kinds of traumas and the way of uh, the processes of recovering from them. And she contends in that book that this the way we uh, define masculinity and masculine conduct and the kind of aggressive masculinity or um, withdrawn masculinity that we tolerate, uh, we're used to tolerating from men, may make the process of recovery even harder for veterans. And this is precisely what the women in in that uh, workshop at Walter Reed were being taught, that if the men withdrew, well, you are just supposed to let them withdraw. And if they become hostile and aggressive and violent, uh, you're, you're supposed to tiptoe around and try to prevent that from happening. And if it happens, you're supposed to adapt. <laughs> and that's one of the three A's. And just adjust your attitude to tolerate whatever your husband does. And, of course, uh, Judith Herman's point is as long as that behavior is tolerated, the, the soldier and the soldier is never called on his behavior, how how is he going to even begin to try to adjust to the standards of of normal life if he can just get away with with anything it it makes everything makes his situation worse you know that reminds me of something else i found pretty extraordinary when you were talking about um the <clears throat> excuse me the um the sort of PTSD treatment plans that emerged in the 1980s where um, they wouldn't talk about shoulds or morality, the, the therapists would not talk about shoulds or morality and, quote, and no talk about wrong. Um, and 
I found that really interesting that you made the con- the contrast between that and many of the like Vietnam veterans for whom it was really important to talk about accepting responsibility for for what they'd done. And the thing I found really interesting, we can go here if you want or not go there if you don't want, but I found it so interesting that um, that was in the 1980s when a lot of sort of the non-morality of um, postmodernism was really hitting a lot of philosophy. And yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that a direction you want to go? Mm-hmm. If you can't, if you want to go there, we can go there. If not, we can. I can ask you a different question. Well, I can. I can try to answer that as briefly as sure. possible. It's complicated, but you know, PTSD was was originally. Um, uh, established as a psychiatric diagnosis um, after the war in Vietnam through the the um, leadership of psychiatrists like Robert J. Lifton who had worked closely with um, Vietnam vets against the war in rap groups that they established and, and Lifton worked with them for a couple of years very closely with them and those Vietnam vets felt a lot of of guilt about what they had witnessed and what they had done in uh, Vietnam, and their own their own guilt, their own sense of having done wrong, um, and having been part of a system that was doing wrong. Uh, and of having been betrayed by their own officers, all of those things played into the the um, difficulties that they had in rejoining normal, uh, so-called normal life when they came home. So um, they, the symptoms that they suffered formed the basis for the psychiatric diagnosis that was then called post-traumatic stress disorder and um, it and the treatment that they got at that time was to be in rap groups like this with other veterans where they talked together uh, openly about what they had done what they had witnessed how it made them feel and in that way work through their problems with one another and and actually, you know, sort of came to terms with their experience and were able to go on with their lives. Now, when when uh, PTSD then got watered down into uh, this notion that you're not supposed to talk about things that you've done wrong, where where it it, it goes back to. Um, it sort of reverts to an old Freudian notion that anything that uh, is making you anxious or nervous or whatever um, must come from your childhood in some way. So psychiatry is no longer interested in uh, your guilt or your sense of moral wrongdoing, but rather in what this all goes back to in your childhood. Uh, so uh, we got farther and farther away from the actual trauma that caused the upset in the soldiers and diverted it into into uh, a lot of talk about other things that didn't really seem even to the soldiers to be important. Since that time, psychiatry, military psychiatry has taken another step under the influence of the big pharmaceutical companies uh, and has gone from the principal focus on talk therapy to um, the dispensing of drugs. And uh, soldiers are being given enormous cocktails of all kinds of drugs. Antipsychotic drugs are prescribed as sleeping pills. Um, and most important, they're getting opioid narcotics prescribed for uh, any kind of physical pain or emotional pain. And we learn now, after the drug companies claimed 
that they were perfectly harmless and and only served to relieve pain, we learned that they are actually very highly addictive drugs, particularly in young people, and they're very strongly implicated in suicides. And as you know, um, I think the current rate is something like 22 veterans uh, still in the military uh, taking their own lives every single day. And this is not counting veterans who have separated from, from the military. And uh, large numbers of these suicidal vets are being treated by the VA with these pharmaceutical drugs. And uh, at the same time, everybody bandies around this diagnosis, PTSD, um, even though the treatments for it have changed dramatically, the the idea of it has changed dramatically, um, and uh, I think the soldiers now are not being treated in, in the ways um, that did prove to be helpful to Vietnam vets in the old days when the psychiatrists worked very, very closely with them. I, I can't remember exactly the the first two lines of trauma and recovery, but it's something like atrocities are those events that are too horrible even for words, and that's the meaning of the word unspeakable. And yes, of course, part of her point is that is that you do need to speak about it, and in, through speaking about it and in making meaning of it, one is able to, as she says, never recover from but transcend. The, yes. the the trauma, and it seems that if they're not encouraging people to to talk about it, but instead um, um, doping them up, um, it seems that that is um, it, it, that's that's just the same old same old. Um, I keep thinking of R.D. Lang's three rules of the dysfunctional family, and rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist, and rule A2 is never discussed the existence or non-existence of rules AA1 or A2. And it seems they're falling right back into that dysfunctional, we don't talk about the trauma mentality, and that's just, that's just horrible. Well, there, you know, there are so many of these uh, soldiers now. I mean, I, everybody comes back changed, uh, even, even the non-combatants, just being on a forward base that's getting shelled from time to time, or even on uh, one of the major bases like Bagram or Kandahar, where, you know, the occasional rocket lobs in, um, is is nerve-wracking. And people can develop a very strong case of PTSD who have never been in combat. I test off the charts for it myself, and even when I was not nothing but an aid worker, so um so i understand how how that works but um it, it for those who have um who still suffer from the guilt of things they saw or things they did and there are many of them who have that kind of moral injury unless they manage to expiate that guilt in some way um they're they're very likely not to make it and i do write about the um the, the suicide of a soldier who had been part of the iraq invasion and uh during his time in iraq uh he was apparently ordered by a superior officer to shoot to um, Iraqi prisoners who were in his charge. He was ordered to pull the trigger, and he did. And he could not live with that. And his parents and family struggled um, for the better part of two years to get help from the VA for him. And they, they couldn't get him anything but drugs from from the VA. They couldn't get any help for him, for him at all and he finally succeeded in in taking his own life. I I interviewed another um 
ex-Marine who had come home um, pretty badly traumatized after two back-to-back deployments in some of the toughest parts of the war. And he, he was in pretty bad shape when he came back and was on the Marine base at Quantico, and there he was given this cocktail of drugs. And uh, because initially, when he returned from, from uh, combat, he was very hypervigilant, very um, irrational, very explosive and angry and uh, alternating with being withdrawn. And his wife, who was also a Marine, co- finally complained and after six months and said, if you don't get help, I'm leaving. So he went for help to the doctors on the base, and what he got was this cocktail of drugs, which he said turned him into a zombie. He said one of the drugs they gave him for sleep was enough to knock out an elephant. And for three years, he existed in that zombie-like condition because the psychiatrist kept telling him, well, you just have to give it time. You have to, you have to be patient. This will take effect. And, you know, and the, the man knew that he was a zombie, and his wife was complaining. Uh, but still, they could not get the psychiatrist to do anything else but give him more and more drugs. He was one of the lucky ones who finally found his own way into a special program, a special kind of old-fashioned rap group at uh, Walter Reed, and he was able to ditch the drugs, and he came through it. I talked to him more than a year after his recovery, and uh, he was doing pretty well. And uh, he said to me, if only, if only they would stop giving the drugs to the soldiers, if the, if everybody could go through the kind of workshop that I went through, this special rap group with other veterans, if if they could uh, go through that, he said, I think a lot of us would be all right. But that is not the course that's being taken. They are being given drugs. So we have about about one or two minutes left, and. Um, I would like to read one line toward the end of the book, which I thought was just brilliant. I thought the whole book was brilliant. And, and then I would like to ask what you'd want for people to do with all this information, listeners to this interview. And the, the quote is, The performance of war, the surges and night raids and airstrikes, may mask the real war, the everlasting privatized and secret one. And you don't have to respond to that. You can if you want. But I, just, I wanted to put that quote in this interview somewhere because I loved it so much. Um, so basically, what do you want? What do you want for readers to, for listeners to take away from this? What do you want them to do? Um, well, I want them to stop, stop allowing the government to make war. You know, it's become much easier for the government to do it since they uh, banished the draft, and we now have this all-volunteer army drawn from the, some of the poorest areas of the of the country. And without the involvement of families across the country thinking that their kids may be called up to fight the wars and pushing back against the government to restrain it, um, the the, the uh, president can just go ahead and throw soldiers at whatever conflict he wants to. And as we know, we have more than a thousand bases around the world, and we don't know the half of what those special forces on those bases are doing. So there is this extraordinary privatized war of special forces and uh, mercenary security contractors uh, that uh, that is carrying out a kind of secret foreign policy of this country that the citizens know very little about. But to sustain these wars, we the the government has to have this group of uniformed soldiers to go out there and fight in something like the style we've become accustomed to from watching war movies. So in a way these soldiers are being used as a to to front a war that is much more secret, much more private. 
uh, than anything we citizens know about anymore. And as far as I can tell, citizens don't really care much about knowing about it. As long as it's somebody else's kids now who have to go off and fight the war, well, we'll just settle for that. But what it's done to corrupt the democracy of this country um, is is extraordinary. I, I hope that now, after all these years of it, that people are catching on to the fact that these wars have served principally as a great transfer of wealth from the public treasury to the pockets of the war profiteers who are doing very nicely on these wars and looking around for more places to stage them. And I hope that citizens will do as as we did during the Vietnam War and take to the streets and say, you cannot do this. You cannot go around making wars and throwing our kids into them. And we are the last country on earth that is still doing this. <laughs> The Europeans don't don't do this anymore unless they are coerced into joining some coalition led by the United States. Um, everybody is wary of the U.S. and everybody is concerned about making peace in this world, except us. And uh, citizens need to turn that around. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your book, and thank you for the conversation today. Thank you very much, Derek. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks. Me too, you.